And we start with the breakfast keynote by Paul Arenot, uh, following the tradition of previous works. And uh, Paul Arenot, uh, we all know who he is, but just to, yeah, for those who don't, uh, he's a well-known developer at Mozilla and also um, uh, an editor of the Web Audio API spec. So please welcome Paul Arenot. And yeah, there will be time for questions so during this hour. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's going to be the third year of this talk. Um, following the so yeah last last year I was in uh, in Berlin so essentially I did the, the same as last year so I copied my uh, old slides replaced a few texts essentially the same uh, so what we're going to talk about today I'm going to have uh, yeah a couple little information little statistics what we've been doing uh, during, uh, it was one year and a couple months uh, since the previous one. Um, so we did, yeah, quite a lot of, of commits and changes, but we'll uh, have a look um, into what happened, what type of changes, uh, and why. Then we're going to try to answer the question, where are we in the standardization process? So. Uh, what status the spec is in, and uh, and then finish with what's next for the WebG API in the standards group. So some statistics. Um, we merged uh, 139 pull requests uh, this year. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a lot. Um, so if we can have a look. Here, so a bunch of stuff, completely random, multiple pages. We only have nine issues left open on the repo. Uh, that's because of two things. First, we did some work. And second, we punted on a number of those for and moved them to a V2 repository that we'll talk about later. So only nine issues. Of course, those are the hardest, right? So it's going to take some time to finish, but that uh, should be should be fine. Um, most things are under control. I think most things are decided, and now we have to write the actual English text. So some statistics in terms of commits. So that's one bar per week, and that means six. For example, here six commits per day during the whole week. So that's quite a lot. So that's uh, this big bar is when we all met in Seattle to do a face-to-face -face with our working members. A lot of work this day, but like, and picking up steam. This is uh, this bar here is when uh, my colleague uh, Boris uh, f came into the repo and filed a bunch of issues for the audio worklet specification, and then we had to fix a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean you can see like some periods where we don't do much, but like when we start working, we we start working. Um, uh, again, contributor count, so uh, 17 this year, uh, so the usual, of course, BBC, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Mozilla, and W3C folks. Uh, quite a few people not affiliated because either the company is not a member or um, they're just independent uh, people. And always thankful for the occasional typo fix from uh, someone just uh, reading the spec and finding a typo and submitting a patch. That's always uh, always nice to wake up to someone uh, having just submitted a patch to make it better overnight. So somehow last time I forgot that we now have a Japanese translation of the spec of all things. So I can load it up. It's, uh, it looks strange to me because I don't read Japanese at all, but like it's uh, everything we've written, uh, but like um, in Japanese, like the same, uh, the, sa the same, the same stuff. So yeah, quite a lot of work. You might uh, recognize the name um, uh, G200K. Um, KG is uh, it's always been around in the in the audio audio world. I feel. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for him. 
Uh, it's trying to keep that updated, but of course it's a bit hard when you're uh, only one person tracking all the commits. So news in the browser engine market. So since last time Edge stopped using their own um, rendering engine. So their, uh, their implementation was derived from the Chromium implementation uh, at the time, but had diverged, right? So it could have been the start of a count of a new implementation. However, Edge um, completely moved to Chromium. We call it Edgium. Um, and uh, so that means that Edge is exactly compatible with uh, Chrome, Chromium now. Uh, so it's sad to lose an engine um, because we, we like diversity and we like to implement things differently. Uh, but that's life. On the brighter side, uh, you might know the Servo project. So it's an experimental, uh, new, completely new rendering engine for the web uh, that we started in Mozilla. It's written in Rust language. And uh, they are trying to do VR stuff. And so when you do VR, you need audio. And so they started writing a brand new WebAudio API implementation. Uh, so it's absolutely not finished, of course. But they are doing first the nodes that are helpful for them to do VR. So for example, all the specialization and playback of samples, reverb, that kind of thing. So I don't know exactly where they are, but it's, yeah, it's progressing and it's, uh, it's looking nice. Um, they are very happy to help people contributing to it. So if you want to learn Rust or, or just have a look, um, yeah, just go on their, uh, on their re repo and, uh, and have a look at the issue. It's very well uh, um, triaged and tagged. So like easy issues are clearly labeled. You can ju just jump on them. Um, and Rust is not that hard to, to, to pick up and it's really cool. So yeah, if that's if that's interesting. Also, of course, contributing to Firefox is, uh, is always cool. So administrative stuff. So the two people that uh, do standard stuff for the WebGL API are Raymond and Hong Chan. And uh, Raymond was uh, my co-editor, and he's now the chair of the working group. But somehow he still do edits. Uh, so yeah. And Hong Chan is now replaced uh, Ray as a co-editor. So I now co-edit with Hong Chan. Hong Chan has written uh, the bulk of the audio worklet uh, specification text, oh, amongst other things. Um, now, yeah, the type of fixes uh, that came in during this, uh, this past year, so no features. We didn't do uh, any new feature, I don't think. I couldn't find a single one. We did things to uh, comply with the com candidate recommendation process. Uh, so for example, having the privacy review, the interna internationalization review, um, so a bunch of transverse, transversal reviews uh, that help finding issues with maybe privacy issues in the spec or Internationalization, we don't have too much, but they did find the problem with encoding and string sort ordering, like something they are good at. So that was good. Bug fixes, so constantly, constantly we find things that uh, are like bogus, like an algorithm that doesn't return or that kind of thing. So um, need to fix those, especially because Servo is trying to really not look at other implementation for implementing. So they don't really like to look at Chromium or Firefox to understand how to implement something. They really refer to the spec and try to implement is the clean room implementation. So they found a bunch of stuff as well. Specification hole, there were, there were still some, but less so than uh, the previous times. So the previous time, for example, we saw that the Dynamics compressor was absolutely not specified, and we had to retro-specify it. So that was annoying, but like that's finished now. And as you can see, a million typos. Uh, Ray has been doing a top-to-bottom rereading of the spec and found like so many typos and like rephrased a bunch of stuff so it's clearer and that kind of thing. So, 
So yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing, no features is the important bit because we're in late, late, late stage of the text. However, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about new features in this presentation by the end. So new in the spec, what has happened? That's going to be uh, roughly in chronological order since last time. Uh, so the, the first thing I'm going to talk about was the oldest. Uh, so now, as uh, if you've been reading my, uh, my new blog I started, you, you've, you've, uh, you've read that some stuff seems simple. But it's very, very complicated to agree or to specify tightly. Uh, so some stuff are like two liners to 10 minutes and like we just all all in the same room or on the same call. Everybody agrees. 10 minutes later, I just do a patch, open the pull request, Raymond looks at it, clicks merge, that's done. Some other issue that seems very small on the same scale took like a number of years because either it was not that important, super, super uh, divisive, so we couldn't agree, or like simply technically difficult to specify. Um, generally this year it's a long series of little changes if, if, you, if you exclude uh, the audio worklet, which is quite sizable and complicated. So let's, let's start, just a list of things that changed. Uh, Convolver node buffer and wave shape node curve can now be set more than once. That was unclear. We, it flip-flopped a number of times during the year. So at first it would we, it was possible to set multiple times, then we prevented it throwing an exception, and now it's uh, possible again. Uh, careful. Uh, setting the, convolo, the, the buffer of the Convolver node is still uh, synchronous on the main thread, so you can block for a long time your main thread. So I'm going to talk about that a bit later. I tried to change it, uh, so I implemented it asynchronously in Firefox, and then tried to run the web, web platform tests. It went, uh, it went red, like a lot of red, because it was absolutely not compatible with uh, applications that are already in the internet, so we decided, too bad. Has to stay synchronous. Uh, and um, we should have known better and changed it a long time ago, but like somehow went under the radar and uh, now it's, um, it's too late. So new features, as I said, go in the V2. Um, in the V2 repo, which is a new repo, it's exactly the same, but V2 at the end. And I'm proposing to have a new member to be able to allow it asynchronously. So it's very simple. Simplest API you can think of. Instead of just blocking your main thread, just wait on the promise that resolves when everything's finished and the convolution has been prepared. And you know that if you connect and send signal to your convolver, it's going to be convolved. Uh, I have some numbers. So it's about 15 milliseconds of computation on my ridiculous Linux computer per second of uh, impulse, right? So this means uh, if you have, the, I think the longest I found on the web was a Taj Mahal impulse of uh, 30 seconds, uh, means, meaning uh, you drop lots of frame, so it's going to block your display for a long time. And uh, if you are doing a WebGL app and you're not too careful and not using Web Worker, everything is going to go uh, f frozen for one second, something like this, depending on the, on the impulse. A big problem, in fact. Uh, so, yeah, 30, yeah. Lots of them are in the order of 10 seconds, so there's not a theoretical problem. Like when you, when you look into the, the internet. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, a bunch of test cases and uh, we can have agreed, um, and then the call came. Very useful, but like clearly too late for V1. We can't afford to add members. We need to freeze everything. Um, so yeah, that's going to come very early when we start writing the features. So somehow, the specification didn't define what linear PCM was. So that was a bit of a problem, wasn't it? So, so we set out to define it. 
right? Uh, so it's a uh, what is this? Just up. So uh, textbook uh, definition. Uh, so apparently it was uh, it was legal to implement it with a non-linear uh, sample in between the frames. So you could have like something that would sound complete garbage, but would be completely compliant with the spec. We said it was uh, not cool, so we fixed that. Um, so generally, yeah, just saying that Float32 is the normal Float32 that we used on the rest of the platform, and like a bit of theoretical. Um, theoretical uh, sentence to look cool and serious. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it's time, right? To, to, <laughs> when you're doing audio software, make sure you know what your format is. Uh, tail time versus channel count. So it's a big one, it's a bit hard to implement correctly. The problem, I talked about it last time, but now the fix is in, and the shape of the fix uh, is, uh, is quite elegant proposed by my colleague Carl. The problem is uh, when you have a node that has a tail time, so for example, a delay. Well, the delay is the canonical example, actually. But the, the convolver works as well. Anything, anything that can resample, uh, it's, it's input or has a filter because the filter, filter tails. Uh, we say now that we don't introduce jumps or like changes in energy or channel counts if it's noticeable. So we wait for the tail time, and then maybe if it's not noticeable that it goes back to mono, then we apply the change at that time, but not before. So that the support is uh, in implementation. I don't think Blinks uh, Chromium implements it, but we try to make it uh, very precise in Firefox. Um, and it's nice because you can, for example, have a convolver. You switch from mono input to stereo input, and then, the st and then the stereo input finishes, it goes back to mono, but it's not going to jump, uh, because the convolver is going to change modes, but it's going to be completely transparent for the author. But you're going to save a lot of convolution channel processing, because um, when authors cannot, uh, when, sorry, users cannot notice it, we switch back to a single convolver instead of doing like full matrixing. And that's one convolution instead of four, which is sizable. Speed up. A metric ton of audio worklet fixes. Lots and lots and lots of audio worklet fixes. The complexity comes from the fact that uh, the audio worklet interacts with uh, script, scripting and it's less shielded from the complexity of interacting with scripting because it's not using the web IDL interfaces and bindings. So web IDL is an, is an IDL for the web, interface definition language that defines types, calling conventions, what happens, for example, if you pass a NAN inside a function that takes a float so that's well-defined in the web IDL, you can say, for example, it's a restricted float and that's going to automatically throw if you pass the NAN in. Or you can also say it's an unrestricted float, and then you can pass infinity NAN in, that kind of thing. So we can very precisely define interfaces, and that's very nice. However, for the audio worklet case, we interact directly with script because it's lower level. So we need to call directly uh, ECMAScript algorithms and functions, which is complex. Especially, it's complex at the interaction between WebIDL and ECMAScript. For example, uh, you have the ECMAScript records and the WebIDL dictionary, and they are not exactly the same, so you have to explain how you convert one from the other. Um, not doing that allows uh, weird things to happen, it's unspecified behavior, and uh, often you don't know. Like, is it gonna throw, is it just gonna, return an empty object, is it going to do whatever. You, can, you cannot say what an engine should implement. And so we had to define precisely what happens, for example, when you send, when you do, um, when you register you, your new worklet, it's going to pass the class and like try to find if there is a process method on it and the descriptor for the audio params and that kind of thing, walking everything 
iterating over each of those, checking, and then sending the exception at the right time if there is a problem, that kind of thing. Uh, so that was, that was hard, it's very finicky. Also, the number of people that have the knowledge to help us when we have problems, very small group. However, they are very helpful, so that's, uh, that's very nice. I mentioned Boris before. Uh, Boris is the web editor of WebIDL and long-time Mozilla person. And uh, yeah, it's very nice. He's been filing and explaining us very passionately uh, why it was a problem and what were the possible consequences of not doing uh, it correctly. Uh, usually, it's unspecified, so like you could call a, a method and then anything could happen, right? And that would be compliant. Now, another implications of WebIDL is on garbage collection, surprisingly. So depending on the web IDL type you choose, and in this particular case, uh, the type you choose to describe the parameters of the process method. So the process methods input output parameters. Depending on the type you choose on the, um, on the, for the arguments, you, this can mandate new object each time, for example. So you would have, if, if, you, if you were to write the test for it, for example, you would, you would get the process method called twice, store the object each time, compare them, and they should, to be compliant, they should be different. They should not be equal. That's a problem because creating objects on the real-time thread is always um, a very bad idea. So at, initially, we had the wrong type on the process method arguments. And to be compliant, you would have to create an object each time, which is a problem. So we had to change that. And uh, it was like really su surprising. Um, we didn't really anticipate. But that was a, a, an easy change to make. It was not break, a breaking change. I think it could have been breaking if you looked at the prototype maybe, but like it's so important for performance that we just, we just did it. So again, yeah, lots of things were underspecified, not specified, uh, or like the algorithm w was wrong, like triggering infinite loops in some, some weird edge case, things that wouldn't return, um, race conditions where, for example, you register your processor, but it takes some time, and then if you do something else on the main thread, things would get scrambled and your worklet wouldn't uh, work correctly, theoretically. So uh, I really want to thank uh, all the people that have proofread the text, lots of people, especially Civic Mass Script, WebIDL, and both. Um, and uh, yeah, my colleague Carl, that has been implementing again the audio worklet, not looking at Chrome's most of the time. So that was that was good that we could do that. A couple of things we had to look at at, at Chromium because it was under specified, then specified it better for the second implementation. So we still have uh, a couple of things um, missing uh, from issues. So I'm gonna gonna show a little uh, example. So we have, of course, the link to the GitHub issues in the spec, and um, oops. So for example, this one is hard and it's on me. So like. Um, how do you reconcile the JavaScript event loop with the real-time thread? Like which concept you use? And that's important to define things like if you resolve a promise during an audio worklet process method, when does it execute? Does it execute after all the process calls? Does it execute in between the process calls? And like you can see clearly that it's a great source of possible incompatibilities if one engine does one thing and the other one does the other. Um, this is a fun one, uh, opened by Boris, as you can see. Um, for now, the spec doesn't uh, really tell what happens when an exception is thrown in the process method. So it's pretty clear that um, the worklet goes silent. That's spec somewhere else, but it's not spec tightly enough. So there is a bit of a holes there. And um, so yeah, I mean, that, the, the, those kind of uh, little um, detail. Like it's generally understood how it should work, but 
uh, to really be able to implement it in a compatible way without looking at another engine's code needs to be tight. So something that we didn't really spec and found out when the servo people implemented uh, the panner node and the audio listener uh, in their new implementation was how does the panner node interact with the audio listener, right? So it's not really defined in which way or in which order you compute the audio listener and the panner node. And this is important because the audio listener has audio params, right? So you can connect audio to the audio params. So you need to make sure that it's computed in the right order. Otherwise, you would have one block or more of delay between your audio listener moving and your panner node actually panning, right? So you'd have weird latency issues in between the two. So by defining it correctly that the order of computation uh, is so that you compute the audio listener first based on its position and then uh, take all the panel nodes and then compute that. It's like, it makes sense. It makes more physical sense. Um, it's an, I don't know the status of implementations. I think we are more or less all correct uh, on this, but it was not specified. So again, on the media stream track audio source node, no, not track, so that's a typo. It's media stream audio source node. Um, legacy nonsense. So media streams can have multiple tracks, uh, multiple audio tracks. And uh, there was uh, this object that everybody uses, media stream audio source node, where you take a media stream, you just pipe it into an audio context, very useful for WebRTC or um, that kind of thing. It's unclear, it wasn't clear until we fixed it, which track was being used. So if you had two tracks, um, it, we, we spec'd it originally that it would be the first one. Then someone told us it's not order, it's a set, it's not a list. So it's like, ah, so we need to define an ordering. So we are sorting on the ID which doesn't make sense because you IDs, right? So sorting on the ID, taking the first one. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but it's stable. Like we, we have a way to, to a cross user agent to, if you take a media stream, it has like four tracks and you play it the same in the two implementations, you're gonna have the same track picked each time, which was absolutely not guaranteed before that. Another thing is that if you take a media stream, uh, use the media stream module source node constructor on it, and then you remove the track and add a new one, does not change what is going to be piped to the audio context. The original track is always the one that keeps being routed through, regardless of the changes you make to the track or the media stream, right? Which is quite important. Uh, of course, I mean, if you need this, this change, you can use multiple media streams, you can use media stream track or the source node, do your own fade in, fade out, that kind of thing. But that works well. Something else that was also not defined, what happens when the media stream has ended? So for example, because the peer connection has closed or uh, the media element that was uh, the source of this media stream uh, is now ended and is, was not looping. So now it's one channel of silence uh, in line with uh, the audio buffer source node, for example, after uh, it's ended. Uh, until it's disconnected and garbage collected, of course. So our um, favorite topic, the uh, autoplay policy, a uh, source of uh, family problems uh, <laughs> at Christmas uh, every year. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, however, it most of the time lies in the hands of the user agent and not really the specification. Uh, as far as the Web Audio API specification is concerned, we just added provisions in the spec to allow delaying the initial transition from suspended to running. So remember, an audio context starts in suspended uh, state, then we 
do the system calls to wake up the audio hardware and start uh, um, firing the callbacks. When the first callback fires, more or less, we switch to running state. So that means if the audio hardware is very slow to start, then authors can know that it is the case and react. Um, so the provision in the spec we added was allowing delaying this initial transition from suspended to running because the audio context was not allowed to start. That's it. So now you can know that um, the audio context is not starting because you're just looking at it and it's in suspended mode. You can also determine whether or not uh, it's because the audio hardware is horribly slow to start. So anecdotally, in Firefox, we have metrics. It can be um, like the, the minuscule decile, but like still surprisingly represented in the order of 10 seconds to open an audio stream on OS X. So we don't exactly know why that happens or how that happens, but we have clear numbers that tell us it's, it happens. So 10 seconds to open an audio stream, probably like weird hardware or something. Um, so you have to distinguish between slow to start hardware and not going to start because blocked, because uh, not allowed. Uh, there's going to be um, there's going to be an attribute on the document that you would be able to check. So it's going to be something that clearly states if autoplay is allowed or not. And then you can check, is it suspended? Is it allowed to start? Well, if you have both information, you know it's not going to start. Maybe display a little button telling your user, please click here, uh, and this will make sound, and you inform the user, and then the, it's good. The person can close the page if it's not the right time for them, or just proceed and uh, with your program. Uh, that caused a lot of breakage, of course, uh, to, to not uh, auto-start audio contexts. So we added the fact that if you uh, call start on a scheduled source, so oscillators, audio buffers, that kind of thing, uh, from a touch or click handler or keyboard, uh, this will engage the transition from suspended, suspended to running. That unbroke a bunch of uh, web apps that w would not have been, would like people just had them static website on the internet and weren't planning to update that kind of thing. So that and broke a bunch of demos. Um, the usual way to to do it is to call a resume from the touch or click handler or keyboard. Um, try not to spam it. We've seen. Uh, We've seen uh, web apps that on every move, move, click, key, touch is going to call resume. Doesn't hurt uh, because uh, we've optimized a bit. Completely unnecessary, right? Because you can use the, the very uh, elaborate technique of the if statement to uh, not do that. Um, so uh, again, uh, for, the, for the people that uh, are not uh, up to, uh, to the right skill level, if audio context dot uh, state equals running return, that's uh, pretty good uh, in industry standard way. And um, so yeah, generally re the recommendation is to just put a little light box or a pop up on your web app and uh, bind a, a function that's going to call resume uh, on the button that's going to be triggered by a touch or click or something like this. Safe way to do it. Uh, just implement is better for everybody, I think. Uh, sound blasting on a mobile phone in the metro because you're just trying a demo and you just open the page from Hacker News. Not uh, not a good way to wake up. So uh, just just have a little um, simply have a little button and explain what is going to happen. Of course, um, especially the first time the page is being loaded. Uh, Offline audio context that suspends. So we've not implemented that yet in Firefox, but it's useful. It allows uh, doing rendering of very long pieces offline with a very high speed. Uh, you can suspend and then mutate your audio graph and resume again and continue the rendering. Uh, there was this issue where the uh, audio context uh, suspend would round down. So would, you would suspend and you'd be at a time where uh, you've not reached the suspend time. So you don't know what's 
going to happen. And it was very confusing to, um, to schedule more events, while some events you've scheduled have not been uh, done. So we decided to round up instead. Uh, that's a bit better to program for. Uh, we found that it's, well, we always knew that making instable filter or uh, using the bycode of the IIR is very easy. Uh, we tried to find a way to prevent numerical instability, but because the audio program is so generic and low level, uh, anybody can do anything. Uh, so if you have an audio rate signal going into your, uh, your essentially the coefficient computation, then the coefficients can move super fast at your audio rate, and that's going to end up doing NANs or uh, infinity or that kind of thing. So it's extremely costly to prevent it and to always ensure numerical stability in the bike quads at, at, in the real-time thread, that kind of thing. So today we can't do anything, and uh, the spec now suggests that a message is printed in the developer console when the filter becomes unstable. We detect it, of course, and we flush everything to zero. The, the filter is now uh, just passed through, I think. Uh, something surprising. The spec uh, didn't say what to do when you were disconnected the node that was not connected to a node. It throws now. So uh, just wasn't saying anything. Uh, it would just do nothing, I think. Okay. So, audio param value getter, that's a big one. So, it took seven years, I think, since the inception, since I started working on the WebGI API. It was not specified what happens when you get the value attribute from an audio param. It's a complex question because it means you can query a computed value from the main thread of stuff that is computed on the real-time thread, right? It has very strong performance implications. It's now specified what it does, so essentially it gets the current value at the time you're calling it for the current current time value of the audio context, only using the automation methods, right? It's not going to add in the audio because of latency problems and also cross-thread communication problems. So it's no spec. Uh, I th we've implemented it. I think Chrome will do it uh, soon. I don't know soon, but they will do it. Uh, so it's now, yeah, it's now clear and it's going to be compatible. <coughs> Related. Uh, Big word filter not get frequency response was not specified what frequency response we get. Um, so now we call into the value getter so it gets the frequency response at the current time of the call. So if you're automating your filters and, you, and you're calling get frequency response on it, then you will have the filter response in terms of phase and magnitude at this time, which can be useful, I guess. I don't know. Copy from channel, copy to channel. So those are methods that are very useful for high performance applications. It allows uh, skipping lots of copies of audio assets that can be pretty big. Uh, it means we, instead of making a copy and playing back the copy, we just reference the byte on the audio thread without copying anything and just because it's a read-only, we just reference a bunch of stuff and it's, it's nice. And when we want to make sub-buffers or a grain, um, it's, uh, it's very, very fast. So yeah, there was enough by one, but like, you know, the classic programming stuff. And then grab bag of little stuff, audio param versus nan. What happens if you have nan in your low param? Now we flush to the default value. <coughs> Makes sense because some audio param have different uh, magnitude and ranges. The convolver channel now you can set channel count, channel mode. That's also the same thing I did. Bef I said before where you can uh, save lots of computation if you're smarter than that, because you can, uh, instead of having four uh, convolution happening at once for a stereo signal, you only have one if you know what you're doing and, and you're running a lot of convolver. 
reverse playback for your buffer source node. It was under specified, but I'm implementing it, so I found holes and it relates to looping in various ways. I should have made a drawing, but like was a bit lazy. Things that couldn't make it. So cancel and hold at time has a problem in the spec. We are going to wait in Firefox until it's clear before implementing. We had edge case when you connect the delay time of a delay node back to itself via the other pram. Again, not clear what's going to happen. And again, we'll, um, immediately when we're going to say we are done, we're going to find an issue, as usual. Security and privacy consideration. It came again, looked at our spec, and said there is lots of problem. We now find that all the fingerprinting you find online that uh, say they characterize your computer and fingerprint completely, they are not characterizing anything weird. They are characterizing the way floating point works on your machine. So it, it, was, it took long, long analysis. We've, we found that if you're on Linux and you fingerprint yourself, you get a, a hash, then you change the lib math on the computer to a different version, you're going to get a different hash. And it's stable. You can replicate this experiment. It's weird. In Firefox, in, you have a special privacy respecting mode where we spoof the max channel count, always saying 2, and sample rate, always saying 48, to make you uh, uh, fit in the crowd a bit better and not stand out. Still a candidate recommendation, we couldn't make it. We, we asked for a little extension for the charter. Uh, we are blocked because the workload needs to be shipped in Firefox. We need two distinct implementations to call it a rec. That's coming soon, very early next year. We are largely compatible. The web platform tests uh, attest. We, Firefox and Chrome pass most of the tests, both. And they are the same tests. <coughs> So what's next? V2, go there, this URL, and uh, open an issue about your pet feature, or like, what do you want? We'll have a look, and we'll discuss for a million years, and then found a, like a way to please everybody, and then we're gonna implement it. So the slides are gonna be online, I put a bunch of links, uh, it's useful, so there is the project board, so I'm just going to unzoom. So basically, we have a series of stuff that we've decided to do, some stuff we want to discuss still, and uh, some stuff under consideration. So please chime in. And random topic, I like to talk about things that are coming. Noise oscillator, oscillator hard sync, pulse width oscillator, non bond limiter oscillator for clean LFOs. Auto output device selection uh, can be useful. And going lower than 128 samples because that's limiting us in terms of input to output latency in Firefox. We are like down, that's what is limiting us. And we'll talk this afternoon about the audio worklet, what's the unshared buffer story, but we want to improve that in V2. As usual, help wanted. Please contribute. It's an open process. We're all very easily reachable on the internet. And uh, it's fine if you complain, but we want to know that you complain to be able to fix it. Um, how to help us? Same slide, didn't modify it. Just ha join the community group, we'll have a chat about it soon. Low friction, low barrier to entry, just join and have a chat with us. Write tests, discuss on GitHub, contribute patches, happy to mentor on Firefox. And that's it. So, uh, as usual, the, the slide's gonna be on the internet. Have a look at the, all the various links. It's pretty cool, can be pretty cryptic at time, but uh, yeah, happy to answer uh, any question about anything on, the, on this spec stuff. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bob. There's time for some questions. Thanks, Paul. 
Um, I have a need for a headless uh, audio application, so when there's no one there to... Uh, we have a script that opens a browser and gets it running, so the autoplay is obviously a bit daunting for us, and um, at the moment we're just using some um, Apple script to pretend to be a person, but we'd rather not have to do that. Is there any opportunity you think uh, that that could become, say, I, I suppose it's more of a question for Mozilla, that it would be a, an, an option in the browser to allow for certain sites? Is that yes. something that's been discussed? Yes, so it widely depends on the implementation, but I can explain you how to do it on each one. Oh, it's possible now? It is possible. Yay, so in thanks. Firefox, you can disable uh, the autoplay policy altogether and have it always just play. You can also uh, have an allow list, right? So per, your, per website, you can decide that this is allowed always, and or this website is blocked always. Um, Chrome probably has something similar. Uh, we'll have a look, but yeah, it's Great. possible. Thank you. <coughs> hey, Paul, thanks for the update. I'm kind of wondering <clears throat> about the change to the disconnect behavior. So in other places, it seems like uh, things have been changed to remove throwing behavior when you're calling a function that might not have any effect. I'm kind of curious why uh, disconnecting a disconnected node now throws. So sometimes we like to not throw when it's a legitimate uh, thing you would be able to code, and it's probably not an error. It's just it simplifies your code by having less special cases. However, disconnecting a node that's not been connected is probably a programming error. So we want to sing signal that back to the author because it's probably just a bug in the software and not like just error checking, they would be redundant, not particularly useful. Also, it's in line with how a disconnect works. Uh, for example, if you call disconnect on a specific pair of input or output with a node, it used to throw. So for example, if you didn't have a connection between the second and the third uh, input to output, and you call disconnect regardless, it was throwing. So it's like consistent. OK, thanks. Any other questions? Um, I know it's not specific to web audio, but could you speak at all to the progress of web MIDI or how that's going in Firefox? Yep, so uh, web MIDI, uh, so the spec is still largely the same, right? A uh, couple changes here and there, but like nothing completely crazy. Uh, in Firefox, we have all, all of the DOM implementation ready to go. We are missing uh, backends, uh, back, um, platform-specific backends. We're still assessing the security problems. Uh, that some call theoretical, but we have reasons to believe it's not quite theoretical. And uh, we're probably going to re-engage with the community next year uh, around that, because we have lots of code just sitting unused. That it's enabled during the tests, and all the tests still pass, so we know it's kind of working. But uh, communication with hardware from a sandbox web browser is always a complicated topic uh, for security reasons. But yeah, it would be, it would be great like, for obvious reasons to be able to use uh, MIDI hardware. But it's not as simple as it looks, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. For your Thank you all.